Paul Clitheroe is, is a director of IPAC Securities, a company he founded in 1983 with four partners. IPAC manages more than $13 billion for clients. Paul is a leading media commentator on financial issues. His books have sold over 600,000 copies. Paul hosted the Money Program on Channel 9 from 1993 to 2002, and Money for Jam in 2009. He also hosts the Money Show, which runs nationally on radio. In February 2004, the federal government appointed Paul as chairman of the Financial Literacy Foundation. The foundation has established a national strategy to improve the financial skills of all Australians and is now implementing this strategy in schools and the workplace. Over one million people have visited the Understanding Money website or requested a hard copy of the work. In 2008, the Rudd government announced the transfer of financial literacy to ASIC. In 2010, Paul was reappointed as chairman of the Financial, financial Literacy Board for a further three years. He is also chairman of Money Magazine, chairman of the Youth Anti-Driving Body, a council member of Philanthropy in Australia, and chairman of the Australian Stream Quartet. In 2008, Paul was appointed a member of Europe Australia in the Queen's Birthday Honours the service to the financial sector through the promotion of financial literacy and to the community. I greatly pleasure in welcoming Paul to here tonight and I hope you give him a warm welcome up to the stage. Thank you uh, very much. To, uh, to Eddie and also to the uh, Sally and other members of the council for, uh, for making me welcome, though I can hardly pretend I'm a stranger. Um, for those of you who hang out at Avoca at all or nearby beaches, I've been coming up. I'm going to sit down if you don't mind. It is a conversation, remember, not a lecture. And uh, I've been uh, hanging out here since I was eight years old when my mum and dad in Griffith used to bring me down to Avoca on holidays and uh, myself and my wife have got a place down at North Avoca. So I am, I am legitimate, okay? I pay rates as well. Um, so basically, uh, for me, this is my, I guess, look, it's my holiday community. And that in itself is an interesting statement, isn't it? Um, because, you know, that, that's part of our, our community conversation. Let's talk a bit about us. Um, you know, it, it is a, uh, and by the way, in terms of conversation, uh, if you're wondering how long we had a boy to tears for uh, some time ago, has anyone been to see Billy Connolly live on stage? Yeah, yeah, at his last one, um, yeah, it was interesting, wasn't it? I was there with my, my wife, and my wife spent half the night covering our then. 15-year-old daughter's ears, um, but it about went for about. Four. Mm, interesting. I better not brush anything. Stay still. Went for about four hours and uh, without a break, and you couldn't afford to go to the toilet because Billy would abuse the living daylights out of anyone going to the toilet. And at about um, five to twelve, the audience were like Billy was just in full flow, and I just thanked the Lords when he finally looked at his watch and said, "You know," he said, "I always make it a point to finish talking in the day that I start." So I'll, I'll, I'll promise you that at least, okay. Now, in actual fact, now look, we're talking about 35, 40 minutes, so I'm a bit of a, bit of a natter, and then I'd love to chat to you outside as well. Now look, I'm not a population expert, I'm not a development uh, expert, I'm not a planning development expert, so you're going to have to take my comments. Um, what I am, I guess, is I'm a fairly global citizen. Uh, the government body I chair is a big body, so I'm part of the OECD for the federal government and so on, and in a sense, a community conversation I've been participating in during the global financial crisis around the world. I've spent most of it at Treasury in Washington, um, uh, Bank of England in England and so on, is really from a community viewpoint, how do we handle a crisis? So I'm, I'm quite used to community conversations. And, and that conversation, and you might struggle to believe this, what's a global financial crisis got to do with tonight? Uh, it's got a lot to do with tonight because the conversation went, we're kind of a bit like you guys talking about your city centre, development of the waterfront. Um, look, I know when I was here, my mum and dad always took me to south of Oka. Uh, why did Vicky and myself buy a place at north of Oka about eight, nine years ago? Because we can no longer put our towel out at Christmas. You know, we noticed population growth, seriously. And so basically the world changes. And there's no point us wanting to go back to the past. Uh, my neighbour uh, at north of Oka is forever saying, this place isn't what it was when I bought in 1973. And um, you know, I say, well, look, you know, you want, nice to be, want to be nice to your neighbours. Well, I say, look, bad luck, you idiot, move somewhere else. But you know, you, you've got to actually grow up a little bit. 
And um, you know, if you want a really quiet little beach, a la you know 1973 at the moment, you're somewhere north of Cooktown. You know, welcome to population growth, folks. It's quite interesting. Back to the crisis. The conversation then was, look, you know, you're wondering. American citizens are outraged that the Americans have, have bailed out, literally used taxpayer money, as you know, and quantitative easing. I'm thrilled about the recent publicity because. In previous decades, I could use quantitative easing to fool you, but now you all know it just means printing money. And it's very sophisticated economic jargon for doing exactly that. Um, and you may have wondered, you know, what's all this about the blasted banks? I mean, the Americans effectively bail theirs out. The Irish banks would have collapsed categorically without a bailout. In England, the taxpayers have bailed it out. In our case, we were lucky. Uh, bailing out the banks cost us nothing except a guarantee. And that guarantee actually didn't cost us any money at all. But what it cost us is competition. And that's the current struggle. You know, funnily enough, uh, had Joe Hockey, I do a radio program with Deborah Hutton on um, Sunday mornings. Well, to be quite honest, I record it on Monday mornings. It goes to air on Sunday mornings. And uh, I had, you have Joe Hockey on there next Sunday. And uh, you know, I was chatting with Joe and I said, because you know, initially Joe was all for, you know, it's about regulating the banks. It's changing the rules. And, uh, and now you might notice Joe's fallen a bit more in line with the government where he's now talking about competition probably being the right way out of this. We actually knew, it was our community conversation two years ago when the government guarantee went in place to be specific 18 months ago, we actually knew what pain that was going to cause the community. Guarantee the banks, where's everyone's money going to run? The banks. Many of you will have money, retirees, in perfectly good mortgage trusts, not silly cruddy ones like West Point that were offering you, you know, 14 per cent and by the, if anyone's ever offering you a really high return, just take your money and run for your life, William, it's really simple. Um, it doesn't exist. There is no free lunch in the world of money. But many of you will be in good mortgage trusts, perpetual, AXA, whatever it may be, and they are good trusts and in good buildings. The tenants are still paying rent, you're getting cash flow. But if you put your money in there, want to get it all back in a year's time to buy a bigger place in Gosford, whatever, it isn't there for you. Why did that happen? Because basically a whole bunch of people made a community decision to protect the banks. Right or wrong? Well, the reason we kind of know it's right, as far as this is where I think history is useful in community conversations. And the reason we knew that decision is right is a whole bunch of gentlemen, uh, for those of you who've done economics or businessy type stuff, you're probably forced to read um, uh, Friedman, Milton Friedman's 1951 book. Uh, he, he's uh, long since dead. But his 1951 book, History of the US Economy, actually sets out a set of rules for the next economic crisis. In other words, he looks at the Great Depression of the 60, 1860s, the Great Depression of the late 1880s, which was the worst of all depressions documented, and then, of course, the 1929 to 1934 depression. And he sets out a set of rules. And by the way, it's not about high share prices. It's not about rising property prices. This conversation is about a credit squeeze. Apart from locusts and biblical issues, we really do know over thousands of years of history that major economic downturns are caused by credit, credit crises, credit squeezes. In other words, a lack of confidence. And if you're wondering, well, what's that mean about anything? Well, the point here is, is that our system is purely confidence. It's Gosford's economy, your personal household economy, the economy of Australia, the economy of the world. What's paper money really worth? You pull a $50 bill out of your wallet, what is it actually worth as a fundamental underlying resource? Nothing. Which is why at the moment many people around the world are turning to gold, isn't it? Because they feel it has value and they worry with the Americans printing money and so on, we may debase our currency. I think they're, I'm pleased to say, I think they're, they're grossly uh, pessimistic and I don't see it personally. But the issue is community conversation. Why around the world is step one when we see a crisis coming? And these credit crises have been going on. We've got them documented back to nearly 3000 BC, by the way. And that what happens is very few societies have ever run on people walking around with wheelbarrows of cowrie shells, seashells, or gold, or whatever. Basically, even uh, down on the Nile 5,000 years ago, a merchant buying a ship, building a new ship to carry his cargo or grain, didn't rock up with a barrow of gold. You know, it's not good practice, you're going to get robbed. He turned up with a promissory note, a promise to pay. And that basically is where our banking system came from. There's nothing new in any of this. But once the basic, the system freezes up, I mean, does anyone really think of every dollar you've put in the bank, that dollar is available to each and every one of us the instant we want it? Of course it isn't, otherwise the banks are going to go broke. We all know they lend it out on 25-year mortgages or whatever at a higher rate of interest. And that is where confidence does mean we get bank runs. Um, I'll never forget, as a relatively um, youngster, uh, I started my company up by then, I was in George Street in Sydney, and since, do you remember when George Building Society was going to go bankrupt, was the rumour. Some of you might have been very nervous about that. We're now talking the late 1980s. And I'll never forget sticking my head out the door and seeing Neville Rand with a microphone saying, it'll be all right, it'll be all right. 
the St George Building Society is perfectly safe. And people in queue were going, bugger off, never, we want our money. And um, literally people were queued up outside the Building Society. And what you do, there are community rules about this as well, by the way, when you get a run, everyone bands together. Other banks, other building societies, government, and you basically get trucks of money at the back door with security guards. Trucks of money come in, the money goes out, and as the money keeps pouring out, basically what you'll find will happen is that people, actually the queue starts to disappear as people see people with their money. We're lemmings, we, we panic. The other thing I find really funny is once in a while back then, by the way, there wasn't a truck there fast enough. So St George Building Society clerks were instructed to say, Sir or Madam, you're at the front of the queue, the cash is going to be 45 minutes, would you like to wait or would you like a St George Building Society bank check? Most people said we take a St George Building Society bank check, <laughs> a building society check, from a building society they thought was going to get bankrupt. And there's some great interviews of people walking out saying, thank God my money's safe. And, uh, <laughs> and guess what, by the way, three days later, the queues reversed. Guess what happened when the queues reversed? Everyone put their money and their St George Building Society checks back in again. And what, what was the difference? The difference was if you wanted your money, you could have it. What are we talking about? Community confidence. So basically what we do know, and uh, the, the, the US Treasurer gave us a wonderful demonstration of this in 1931, when the US Treasurer looked at the imminent failure of the US banking system, guess what happened in the last Great Depression? They'd made all sorts of silly loans, uh, as the boom continued, the loans got more aggressive, people borrowed more money, loan documentation, loan documentation standards got worse. Heard this story before? Just go through history, it's repeated about you know, three times a century for 7,000 years. And we're never going to learn. Same process. What happens is credit dries up. When credit dries up, the crunch comes and then basically the banks go, crikey, I'm not lending my money to anyone, even to another bank. And everyone starts sitting on money, money slows down. Be quite blunt, do I hold more cash in my personal portfolios and my client portfolios than I did two years ago? Yes, I do. Yep, we all get a bit conservative, don't we? And also, by the way, the bank will actually pay, like many of you retirees here tonight, look, 18 months ago I grabbed a Westpac five-year 8% term deposit for my super fund. 8% term deposit? Fantastic. Haven't seen that for a while. So the world changes. 